Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. I want to start this podcast by saying thank you. I know at the end of every video I say thanks for watching, or listening in the case of the podcasts, but after last Monday's podcast, I really feel I need to send out a special thank you. First off, that podcast, the views were way, way down on, like 40% lower than normal. And I think a big part of that is that YouTube notifications are just completely wonky. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But despite the decreased views, I got more comments on that video in the first 12 or so hours than I do generally in a week or even the lifetime of a video. From the time I posted that video until the time I went to bed, there was over 600 comments. It just blows my mind. And so many of them, in fact, I think all but maybe two or three of them were very positive sort of comments. Not just positive to me, but positive to each other. There were people relating to my experiences of being keto in a non-keto family. There were people sharing advice to me and to others how to potentially convert family members over to keto or talking about how they work around their non-keto family members. And when I first started Serious Keto, I wanted my channel to be different in some way. Certainly, I wanted it to be different in that I wanted it to be more about food. I wanted this to be sort of a, a good eats, modernist cuisine, America's test kitchen sort of vibe to it. I wanted it to be about the fun that we can all have in the kitchen, learning, creating, etc. But I also wanted it to be about community. I wanted us to be a group of people that could share and support and encourage one another. And that's one of the reasons why I try to get into the comments as often as I can. Whether that's actually replying to a comment, which gets kind of hard when you get over 600 comments a day, but at least letting people know that I read them by giving it a thumbs up or giving it a heart. But when I talk about community, I don't just mean an interaction between each of you and me. I mean the interaction that you have with one another. And that's one of the things I saw as I looked through the comments in last week's podcast. Just how much all of you interact with one another. It's clear looking at the likes and the responses to comments that so many of you seem to enjoy reading the comments and interacting with one another and interacting with me. And really, I, I think that's the ultimate compliment that you can pay to this channel. I, I think I've said it before. If not, I'll say it right now. Serious Keto and this channel is nothing without all of you. If all of you aren't here watching my videos, leaving comments, then <laughs> it's nothing. Serious Keto's over. So thank you. I owe you. I'm so glad that you're all here. And that brings me to YouTube notifications, which I alluded to a moment ago. I don't know what's going on. People leave comments to me. Some of them will direct message me on Instagram or Facebook, or they'll use the contact form on my website, which it's really not for that. But they will contact me to tell me they're not getting notifications. And that's nothing on my end. I can't control that. All of you can go into your YouTube notifications and see how things are set. Do you have things turned on or not? But it seems like it doesn't matter a whole lot if you've got things turned on or not. YouTube just seems to be rather random in how it notifies people when videos are released. They also recently turned off email notifications, which makes no sense to me. They say that less than 1% of people use them. And I'm assuming that's because maybe they're measuring by click-through rate, meaning do people get the email, open the email, and click the link on the email to get to the video? I never did that. I would get an email and say, oh, look, so-and-so released a video today, and then I would go to YouTube and just open up their channel and watch the video. I still liked getting the email notifications as a reminder. And maybe that's why YouTube shut it down. They felt people weren't using it, but to me, all I needed was that visual reminder. Oh, look, there's a new video, and I would go out there. Long story short, or too long, don't read. You can pretty much count on three videos a week from me. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And sometimes it's four videos, sometimes it's two videos, sometimes it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, sometimes it's Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, something like that. If you get out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning, 
you're going to find some videos by me. Whether I released them that day or maybe there was some little stagger. So what I'm saying is don't necessarily rely on YouTube notifications to know when I've released a video. Now this particular podcast isn't going to have a particular theme. It's going to be probably smaller little snippets. Last week, that keto in a non-keto family thing, that ran pretty long. That was like a long, long segment. So this time, going to be a little bit more bite size. Think of this as like tapas. This morning, I saw an interesting thing out on Amazon. My plunger whisk, which you get to see in a number of my videos, that was a gift to me from my mother-in-law probably five years ago. And the spring on it is getting a little bit weak. It doesn't Incidentally, I just edited out a play acting thing of me using the plunger whisk and I realized it looked really obscene. But the spring in the plunger whisk is wearing down. I thought I'd get a new plunger whisk. I got out onto Amazon and you know how when you pick a product down below, it'll say customers often order this with these other two things. The other two things were both Dash Minis, a Dash Mini griddle and a Dash Mini waffle maker. I guess I am now officially an internet influencer. If Amazon now sees the products that I use together in videos often as things people should buy together, I just find it kind of amusing. It makes me feel kind of cool. A topic I had covered a handful of podcasts ago was on why recipes don't work. In case you haven't seen it, I'm actually going to link to that right up here. It's in my whole podcast playlist, but I'll link to that video up here because I think it's very important. Every so often, I will get comments from viewers saying, I made this recipe, it didn't work. And it's strange to me because I will make a recipe over and over and over again just to be certain that it works before I make a video of it. And then I'll get you know dozens or hundreds of comments from people saying they made it, they loved it, it was great. And then I'll get one or two where people said it just didn't turn out for me. And if you're one of those people and you haven't watched that podcast, I would really encourage you to go back and watch it. But I've since discovered another element that can really cause a difference in whether a recipe turns out or not, and that is the brand name of the ingredient. Sometimes when we make a substitution, we don't think it's a big deal. In the case of like the pancake recipe that I did recently, I have found after making it a few different times with different sweeteners, Boca Sweet is important in that. I tried making it with just allulose, not nearly as good. It was really bland. If you look at, say, the Tortilla 2.0 recipe that I did, the brand of paneer cheese that I use in that can make a difference. The moisture content is important in these tortillas in how they cook up and later on how they hold together if, for example, you were making enchiladas. I recently did a fat bomb recipe where the author of the recipe recommended using an 85% cocoa lint chocolate bar. I didn't have one of those. I had a Lily's chocolate bar that was a dark chocolate bar, and I used that. And I'm not exactly sure what Lily's uses off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's got some alcohol sugars in there. And just as I was melting it, it, it kind of seized up. It didn't come together real nicely. And it all came down to just using the brand. So whenever I make a recipe and it doesn't turn out, the very first thing I ask myself is, what exactly could I have done wrong? I put the blame on me. And if it feels like you did everything exactly the way the recipe author or video maker did it in his or her video, then it's time to start asking about brands. What brand of psyllium husk did you use? What brand of chocolate did you use, etc. From time to time, I have viewers say, you should show some of your recipe failures. That way we can learn from your mistakes. Well, generally, I don't think a lot of people want to watch uh, an 8, 10, 12 minute video where the result is bad. But certainly, as I make mistakes, I will tell you about them. And this is one of those instances. Pay attention to brand names if the brand names are specified in a recipe. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. When I do these podcasts, and sometimes just my regular videos, I will try and sneak something in just to see if people catch it. Sort of little Easter eggs, whether it's a pop culture reference, you know, I've always got the shirts on, or a movie line, or a song lyric, or just something subtle that maybe I have in the background or something like that. And lots of times you guys catch it. 
And to me, that's fun. It means you're paying attention. Last week, we had the child from The Mandalorian, Star Wars Mandalorian, in the background behind me. I think what I'm going to start doing is putting something back on that little Fender guitar stool and just see if people catch it, see if they see what it is. Sometimes I'll mispronounce a word, and sometimes it's on purpose, just to see if people are paying attention. Other times, it's just because I didn't know any better. And one of those instances is Deirdre's bread. I said it correctly that time. I've been pronouncing it like Deirdre or something like that, and I don't know, I, I think at some point there was a character, some female character played by one of the Monty Python guys named Deirdre or something. I don't know why in, it was in my mind that that's how it was pronounced. I don't know that I've actually known anybody named Deirdre or Deirdre personally in my life. But I went back and I rewatched her bread video and she starts right off saying, you know, hi, I'm Deirdre. Shame on me for fast forwarding past the intro and going straight to the recipe. But the reason I bring up Deirdre's bread is last night I had what is annually one of my favorite meals. Because I am in Wisconsin, it takes until about this time of year until I get some really good heirloom tomatoes out of my garden. And few things excite me more than having a meal that from end to end, everything came from me. That either I made it completely or it came from my garden. And last night I had BLTs. The bread was homemade, it was Deirdre's recipe. The mayo was homemade from my instant mayo or super easy mayo, I forget what I called that video, the one with the immersion blender. So homemade mayo, the bacon also, cured and smoked by me. I got a video on that too. The tomatoes and lettuce both came from my garden. I also put some of my roasted New Mexican chilies on there just to give it a little something extra. Along with that, my wife made some cream of celery soup that used celery from my garden. And finally, for a beverage, I had some Pinot Grigio, which I made myself. Well, it was a wine kit, but still, I did the whole fermentation and bottling and all that. So like end to end, it was all me. There's just something to me very cool about that. I think we forget there was a time when this was the way people ate all the time. You had an apple pie, the apples came from a tree in your yard. You made the pie crust yourself. Your eggs and your butter and your bacon and your sausage, everything you had for breakfast, the bread that you made, all of this came from you. And I think that, especially in the standard American diet, is why there are so many health issues now. People have gotten further and further and further away from the source of their food. And I just love being the source of my own food. As much as I can be self-sufficient in all things in life, I really enjoy that. So it was a lot of fun having that meal. Super tasty and oh my goodness. Heirloom tomatoes, if you do not garden. Next year, I strongly encourage you even if you've got space for a planter, get yourself a packet of some heirloom garden seeds. I'm a really big fan of Caspian Pink, but I've got all different kinds of heirloom tomatoes, different colors, green, yellow, orange, red, you know, practically black, you know, really dark purple. Once you have one of these, it is going to totally, totally spoil you. It'll be very difficult for you to go back to store-bought tomatoes that were probably picked 1,600 miles away when they were still green, put in the back of a trailer, had a bunch of nitrogen pumped in to sort of artificially ripen them. Whole different flavor. For the final segment of this podcast, this one will be a smidge longer than these other ones. Those were all sort of little tiny appetizers. Fairly regularly, whether it's in the comments or if it's out on Facebook or Instagram, or again, someone using the contact form out on my website, I will get people asking specifically for dietary or health advice. Asking, is it okay to do this? Should I take this medicine? How should I be working out? What should my net carbs be? How come I'm stalling? Should I tell my doctor I'm going on keto? Should I tell my doctor I'm gonna try out your apple cider vinegar tonic? Et cetera, et cetera. And my response to these people is always, I don't give medical advice. I don't give diet advice. I don't give any sort of health advice in general, aside from sharing what I have done myself. I can tell you what I've done, but I can't tell you that it's going to work for you because everyone is different. I have discovered, and I'm sure all of you have as well, 
there is no shortage of experts out on the internet. Sadly, most of them are self-anointed, and they really reinforce a saying that I heard probably 35 years ago and has stuck with me ever since, which is, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Sometimes I think people see a comment by someone else and they absorb that, and that becomes their source of information. Other times people may read an article or watch a, another keto video or health video and that becomes their source of information. Sometimes people take information from the USDA or FDA or something like that and, and decide that's their source of information. And then whether it's because they want to be a know-it-all or whether because they're genuinely trying to help out other people, they get out and they share this information or sometimes force feed this information. Sometimes it's to other people that are commenting on videos. Sometimes it's people coming and saying stuff to me. And very often I find that these are things where people are making broad generalizations based on a single person, based on their own experiences. So things like, that will totally spike your blood sugar. Well, maybe for you, but I've tested and it didn't for me. So clearly it's not a universal thing. You know, there's also situations where there are things that are generally held to be true, but as time goes on, we find out they're not. I mean, I've even watched videos by people that I trust and respect, like Dr. Eric Berg. You can go back in time and look at some of his videos and you can see where his position has changed on certain things. Nothing huge, but if you were watching that original video and that was your only source of truth and didn't watch the newer one, you might find yourself believing and or advising other people based on something that's not accurate anymore. But ultimately, the biggest reason that I don't give advice is I believe that everyone is different. Our bodies all react differently. Not only are there different physical body types, you know, mesomorph, endomorph, ectomorph, but there's different degrees of insulin sensitivity. There are people that are diabetic, type one or type two, or non-diabetic, and I just don't feel comfortable giving out blanket advice like that. Plus, what if I'm wrong? What if, what if I advise you to do something and it works out poorly for you? Then I'm gonna feel bad. You may try and sue me. I don't know, I hope not. But I'm just not gonna give advice on those sort of things. Now, cooking, totally willing to give advice. And I'm willing to share personal experiences. To that end, one of the personal experiences that I will share and it's a question I get probably weekly is from people that are frustrated that their weight loss has stalled on keto. My advice is not a specific do this, you know, switch to one meal a day or up your fat or whatever. It's first, be patient. Keto should be about the overall health benefits that you get. Think about how your body feels now, whether you're still losing as much weight as you were, whether you're 40 pounds away from your goal or 10 pounds away from your goal or 100 pounds away from your goal. If you've been doing keto for any length of time, I know that you have felt some health benefits. Focus on that. The weight will come. I have had periods where my weight is just going up, you know, sometimes a pound a day or two pounds in one day. And I'm thinking, what the heck? I'm doing everything right. I haven't changed what I'm doing. Why is this happening to me? And then, brace yourself, TMI, I'll have a day where I like crank out four really outstanding bowel movements. Usually it's like one. I told you, TMI. And then the next day, I'm four pounds less. Now, I don't believe that I cranked out four one-pound bowel movements. That would be impressive, though, wouldn't it? But especially if you are measuring your weight on a daily basis, expect to see some strange and sometimes odd variations like that. And sometimes it's a stall. The other bit of advice I would offer is if you find you're stalling, that's when it's especially important to track what you're doing. Keep a food journal or use something like Carb Manager. That will give you at least a baseline of what you're doing that's not working. It doesn't tell you what to do, but it does tell you that if your goal is weight loss, what you're doing at the moment isn't getting you there. So it's time to try something different. Maybe that is doing some intermittent fasting. Maybe that is getting out and going for a walk. Maybe that is upping your fat or lowering your protein or adjusting your macros in some other way. 
Maybe it means you do need a cheat meal or something to shock your system and then get back into keto. But I can't advise you on that because we're all different. Just like we all need to own like our blood glucose and ketone measurements, I think we need to own our own lifestyle and what we're eating, how we're exercising, how we're sleeping, etc. So I will stick to the food aspect of things and let the other experts out there handle the medical advice, the diet advice, the exercise advice. And I would encourage any of you, if you're ever feeling the itch to give somebody else advice, get out and do a little internet search just to validate that what you're saying is true. I personally have found that by doing that, I have saved myself a little bit of embarrassment. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, if your issue is stalling on weight, please don't focus on weight. Focus on how good your body feels. Focus on how much better your mood is. Focus on how much better you can think. I just feel like if you're hung up on the weight aspect, then keto is a diet and keto should be a lifestyle, in my opinion. And that is it for this podcast. As always, thanks for watching or listening.